Hey everyone, <clears throat> just cleaning my glasses here, getting ready for you guys. It's Tuesday. What is it? It's April 28th. Wow. That means that, that Friday is May 1st. Can you believe that it's May 1st already? Oh, I see some of you coming on board. Let me see. Let me put my glasses on so I can read your names. Donna Herman. Hi, Donna. And Cindy Abood. And uh, Shirley. Shirley Abevis is coming to us from Alabama. Robin Henson from Maryland. Uh, hi, Dana Madden. Um, and Cricket. Hi. And where, let's see, he's from sunny Bluebell, Pennsylvania. That'd be fun to live in a place called Bluebell. I mean, it just sounds like it's always sunny there. Uh, I'm getting a hi from Marilyn and Linda Klein uh, and Cheryl Frost. Oh, you're all saying that you're excited to see Charlie. I just talked to him. I called him. I said, I'm calling you to make sure that you have a good background and that you are you put your iPad in a place so we're not like, you know, looking at a bad shot of you. Here's Christy Getch from Battleground, Washington. Carmen. Hi, Carmen from Maine. How you guys doing? Um, we seem to have a little bit of a jumpy connection lately, but it, it dies down, I guess. Wendy. Hi, Wendy. Gushy. Happy Tuesday. Hey, you guys, remember yesterday I Googled days and today, Tuesday, we found out it was superhero day. And so I asked what kind of superpower you guys would want. And some of you said, a bunch said to be invisible. Somebody was honest, said, I want to be doing to be invisible so I could s snoop around and kind of check on people. Um, some of you said reading, uh, you'd want to be able to read people's minds. I can't imagine that because if I was reading, if I could read people's minds, you'd know what they were thinking. <laughs> you'd know what they were thinking about you. <laughs> so, um, but you know, when we're talking about superheroes, I got to tell you, one of my superheroes is certainly Charlie Gibson. It really is. I mean, he's, whoops. Hold on here. Uh, let's put this on uh, display. We'll put it on never so we don't lose him at any time. All right. Um, so I want to uh, talk about early morning television. That's what I want to talk about this morning. We've got a lot of you here. A lot of you know I'm going to have Charlie Gibson on because he's one of my superheroes. I think his power... I think his power is to bring out another person's story and to make another person feel comfortable. That's really what it takes to do a show like Good Morning America. And you know, I don't know if there, any of you remember back to when Good Morning America first came on. It came on in another version, I think it was called AM America in probably um 1974 or three. Um, the hosts were Bill Butel and Stephanie Edwards. Oh my God, the brain is still working. I love that. Yeah, it was Bill Butel and Stephanie Edwards. Anyway, in November of 75, I think, um, they brought David Hartman from Hollywood. Do you guys remember David Hartman from The Virginian or from Lucas Tanner? He was Lucas Tanner. And he did that show right before coming to, to New York. Um, and they brought him into New York City and they and the first, do you remember the first female host? Ooh, I'm gonna look to see if any of you, whoops, I'm gonna see if any of you come up with the name. Anybody remember the name? Put it in the comments if you do. See, it's a that's a really hard question. Her name was Nancy Dusso. She was mainly, I think, an actress from Broadway. She was really not a morning person. And she hated it because she said she always had bags under her eyes. Anyway, she um, left. And ironically, in like 77, they were replacing her. And I was actually considered for the job. But quite honestly, I wasn't ready for it yet. I mean, to be in a studio with the likes of Paul Newman and Jimmy Stewart and all these people walking in, that was kind of terrifying in the beginning. But so Sandy Hill got the job, and then in 1980, they replaced Sandy, and that's when I got the job. And actually, I was thankful that I didn't get it for a few more years, 
um, because I was, I think, just better prepared at that point. Um, I did though bring a few pictures. Okay, I always give you a little pictorial uh, overview. So this was 1980. All right, with David Hartman. Whoops, I'll try to get the glare out of it. All right, you guys all remember that. And then in 1987, yeah, 1987, this was like passing the baton. And yeah, look at Chubsy Wubsy there in the middle. I was pregnant. Okay, let's just go on record here. I was pregnant. And um, I can go through all the pictures and I can tell by when I was pregnant, when I wasn't pregnant, what my hairstyle was like. And then, uh, so here's one of the first times, obviously after pregnancy and Charlie and I are in Washington. I think this is 1988. I think that's what it says at uh, the Capitol. And I'll tell you, I I really wanted Charlie to have the job. He was he's so smart, but he doesn't wear it. You know, he doesn't talk down to you. But I remember him being on. Um, he was an ABC News correspondent. He was a White House correspondent and then a Capitol Hill correspondent. And he just knew so much, like he knew every senator's name. He knew, um, you know, what their stance was. It was crazy. Um, but he also had a real humorous side. So I'm going to show you. This is the typical, we had such a great relationship. This is a typical, typical photo session with our wonderful Ida Astute. If you're working if you're uh, watching today, Ida, you were just always so fabulous. And everywhere we were, we knew you were somewhere around capturing it. So here's a typical. All right. So both of us. All right. Come on. Look at the camera. OK. Well, so we both have our hands in our lap. Then Charlie decides, I think I might look a little more, you know, official if I cross my arms. And then do you see what he's doing? <laughs> We aren't cracking a smile. We're staying in character, but he has his hand on my leg and that little smirk. And Arlene, if you're watching, you know, we're, we were always just kidding. Now, this picture was funny. It was fun going through and looking for pictures of me with Charlie. So what's really funny, though, is the note on the photograph. I'm going to read it as I show it to you. <laughs> It will never use this photo, but it's good for a laugh. Just don't let the Today Show get a hold of it. <laughs> I'll have to leave that one in that thing. And wherever we were, you know, we were always so invested in what we were doing. We wanted to talk about the city we were in, and we wanted everyone to just know how, you know, how fabulous that part of the country was or that part of the world. We were always in Washington, of course, for all the inaugurations. That's probably one of my favorite things, you know, just being where history is being made. But then we'd always have our fun moment. You see that? Like they made us these things, these um, license plates. And I looked around and lo and behold, here's mine. Like I have a lot of stuff like this. Is that a girl thing to collect stuff? I, I you know, I, I've done all these things with the Navy SEALs and Special Forces and the Marines. And I've got all those uniforms um, with the Thunderbirds. And I got to ask Charlie, the Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels flew down the East River and they live right up over the East River. We'll have to ask him about that. Um, I have all those uniforms. So like I am the queen of Halloween. You ever need something? You know where to find it. I kept all those things. Most of the pictures were of us eating. <laughs> I could have shown you a million of them with Wolfgang Puck, Julia Child, they were all over. Now, we only went rogue <laughs> once out in the field. And that was on in New Zealand on the South Island. And we found out that it was the home of bungee jumping. <laughs> and we'll talk to Charlie about this because I talked him into it. First, we started the day, the day though, parapointing. Well, here, let me show you this first. This is how we did it. You know, you you were literally attached to a guy behind you. So, you know, we weren't going to die. But this is what we did. Like, we literally went off the top of a mountain called Bob's Peak. And you just soared over the top, like almost touching your feet, dangling over these treetops. I mean, it was a mountain with, like, big trees. <laughs> You'd be in big trouble if you crashed. Then out over the lake. And then there was a football field at a local school and that's where we landed and charlie 
didn't do the the best landing. I remember he was ticked because his pants had green stains on where he got kind of, a, you know, a dragged a little ways. So this is what we did that day though. We also went like whitewater rafting down some river. <laughs> that was one of the most dangerous things. But then we jumped off the bungee bridge. I don't have the chart, the picture of Charlie jumping, but this, that bridge it was like an old rickety bridge and it was, I don't know, 20 stories high and he's not that good with tights. So we'll ask him about that. His wife, Arlene got so mad at us. All right. Last day, you guys remember the last day, September, I don't know, 5th, maybe 1997, kind of a bittersweet day. Um, Celine Dion was there to sing. Uh, it was just terrific. Chevy Chase was there and he, he sat down in the news chair and said, they've asked me to take a look back at Joan's career. So <laughs> that was Chevy Chase. Um, and this was the very last picture. I think it's kind of poignant that that is the last picture of Charlie and me standing, looking at the set. All right, one more thing and then we'll get to Charlie. We always used to give a gift every holiday, the two of us to everyone. I mean, we started off with, you know, not that creative. Then we did little beanies, then scarves and beach towels, everything that said, good morning, America. I've been finding all this stuff downstairs. I think it might be a girl thing. This was like one of our most creative, clever gifts, I think because it was um, an alarm clock, because we all had to get up. And then they gave us these. They made these little baseball cards, see them? Yeah, you know, through the years. And they would say on the back, you know, your name, we sign, we, they'd sign, be signed. That way when we were on the road and you get out and there'd be hundreds of people, we could just like pass these things out. But I was reading, I was reading the back of it. And this one says, well, it says my height and weight, and tr of course, that weight was a lie. <laughs> Whenever we would go on planes, like to go to some off, off, you know, and far place in the world, and the pilot would say, okay, I need everybody's weight, and he'd add it up, and then he would say, all right, I'm going to add a few hundred pounds for all the girls that were lying, and of course, he was right. I also see she enjoys running. Lie, such a lie. And she also, her goal is to publish her own book. Now, you know why I pointed that out, because it gives me an opportunity for my shameless plug of the day. Why did I come into this room? And it is a book about aging and all the interesting, annoying, embarrassing things that come along with it. But my tease, so that you know that it's written with a whole lot of humor, chapter seven is, why can't I lose weight like I lose my keys, phone, and sex drive? And the last chapter, I want to be cremated. It's my last chance for a smoking hot body. All right, with that, let's get to introducing just the nicest guy in the whole world, Charlie Gibson. Grew up there in Washington, surrounded by politics. He was destined to be um, in this job. So let me see, I've got him right here. I just called him to make sure that his shot looked good. We were always like make, making, you know, watching out for each other. So let's get him on the phone. Remember the other day when it took forever for Michael Bolton to pick up? Oh, hi. How you doing, well, doll? I'm doing this actually on my computer, which is... Uh... Something I had, didn't know. Okay, I could do. so we need you to get right in the center of it, though, because I want them to see you. Like, and if you're going to be in front of your laptop, just remember yeah. the little the little green button up at the top. That's right. actually that's the camera. Oh, that's All the right. camera. Okay. Yeah. All right. You ready? All right. Yeah, I'm ready. Nope. Now you're out of the picture. Oh, there I am. Does that work? A little bit more. Oh, there you go. All right, here he is. Say hi, Charlie. Like I if you, to, hi Charlie, is that what I'm supposed to say? Hi no, Charlie. No, <laughs> see what I mean? We always here. I'm going to put you right there. We always teased each other. If if I noticed in the in the makeup room in the morning that you had on one blue sock and one brown sock, 
I would go down, I'd say to the guys, as soon as we open the show, take a shot of Charlie's feet. And I would tease you about it. <laughs> we, worked, we worked together for 11 years, I think, or 12. And I did that one day, and, and you, you keep bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it was it was uh, it was getting getting dressed in the dark um, was always problematic. I, people used to ask me um, how often Arlene would get up in the morning and, and cook me breakfast before I left uh, to go to the studio, and it was zero. Uh, it was, <laughs> I don't think she ever knew I was gone. Yeah, me too. In fact, I will even say there was a, a door that to the in the bathroom that started like squeaking, and I actually got some kind of oil um i and i oiled it so that i like four in one oil yeah that's what yeah that's four in one oil. yep absolutely so everyone has been asking for you and when i announced that you were going to be here i got um i got things like ava carolina said this will be like going back to old friends again i i i try to replace the word old with long time <laughs> long, long time friends yeah, you're the one who's written the book on being and being old old now um, on aging successfully let's get that one right yeah okay you uh, can get older but you don't have to get old how about how about calling the book getting old without with minimum fuss okay <laughs> okay <laughs> uh, say listen the, uh, you're how are you guys faring you live in new york city we are in uh I think we're past 50 days now, Arlene and I, of being in each other's company. Um, we go out every three or four days to the grocery store. She takes a walk every day. Um, and we're right on the East River, so she walks up and down. If the, if the crowds aren't too great on the Esplanade along the river, she'll walk there. Otherwise, she'll go into town. She um, walked the other day by, you know, you think things are moderating a bit. Um, but she walked by Lenox Hill Hospital, um, oh. which is a couple blocks from here the other day. And um, outside were two refrigerator trucks. And boy, that brings it home. Um, we, uh, being on the East River, we're right on the FDR Drive, if people know New York City. We're right over the, East, the FDR Drive. And uh, just above Hospital Row, all these hospitals that are lined up along the East yeah. River. And for a while, the sirens were, Joan, were probably two and three an hour. Wow, um, going down the going down the FDR. So it's all anecdotal evidence, but there are far fewer um, sirens now. Um, that's good than there were. So that's that's uh, heartening. Some although those refrigerator trucks that bring it right close to home, and we go out every night at seven o'clock on our balcony and bang you know bang pots and pans. And, oh, that's and while so we're great. on the periphery of the city, um, it's it's really we we hear some of it, and it's and it's very nice. It's a uh, it's really lovely to to uh, to have all those people out and waving at neighbors on other balconies and stuff. It's 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 a. Uh, you got something hurting. special today, though. Tell tell us what it was like. I know the Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds. It was announced last night. We're going to be flying right down the East River. They must have flown literally past your balcony. What was that I like? Right, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. I'll, I'll, I took some pictures, um, and I'll hold them up against the camera. But yeah, they, they came right up. It, it was in wow. honor of um, of hospital workers yep. and of uh, people who have to be on the job these days. Uh, um, see if I can get a good. Well, you do here. that. I'm just going to tell you. Um, I'm getting a hi, Joan and Charlie from Adrian Best and Bahati oh. Best. Um, Cindy St Stanton says, "Love you both." Denise Payne says, "You guys look great. Great to see you together together again." Okay. And oh, that's nice. Melinda, Say, oh, is Adrian on there? Oh, that's great. Yeah, Melinda, gotta... and Melinda Whitman says, you both are making my day great. Um, Connie Gildersleeve, so thank you so much for joining Joan today. I mean, it's so nice to have best friends on. I mean, hey, hi, Scott hey. Snyder. Scott Snyder. The, now, you guys have to know out there in in home well, scott and adrian were cameramen we were our cameramen uh, yes i got an email from a, from a friend in baltimore or a message from a friend in baltimore richard share who used to be on yeah television down in baltimore with oprah like, winfrey and, and, at uh, one time he's watching I, I i wrote him back and said what what god's name are you doing watching this and oh. 
he said, it's interesting enough hey. to get a life. <laughs> but, but, uh, but we all have time to do this kind of thing now. Um, we have nothing but time. Absolutely. And so say, Arlene and I are, in, I think, over 50 days now. And um, um, we're, we're, we're doing okay. I get a little nervous every time she takes a knife out of the uh, knife holder. Um, she has to keep social distancing six feet, so I know she can't get at me with the knife. <laughs> I'm, that's just kidding. The, but she takes a walk. I, they, they closed the gym in the building and, um, we have a very small gym downstairs. And, um, so I petitioned the co-op board to, uh, to, um, give me the, uh, for the duration of this thing to give me the recumbent bike. bike. Um, so they brought it up and put it in the kitchen and I ride 10 miles on the, oh, on the wow. bike each day. Um, so that's my workout. And that um, reminds me of, of when we were at, um, Republican convention, I think, and we were going up in the elevator and Spencer Christian called me out when I said, oh, I forgot my sneakers and I can't work out. And he called me out and he's watching right now. Hi, Spencer, out in San Francisco. He, we're gonna have him on one of these days. And he made me, he got me, he really got me to come in and make a gym date. And he got me working out after talking about it for years. And you guys were so tired of hearing me talk about it. Um, <laughs> um, this friend of mine calls that uh, psychometrics, uh, which is thinking about working out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but no, that, that, that 10 miles each day is kind of a godsend. Um, it's, I, I'm, I'm so delighted to hear Spencer's watching. I, people don't know one of the, one of the most delightful human beings on earth. We had, we had such good times in the mornings. Um, we, did. we were very. You know, I, and I talk about it with David Hartman when I see him as well. We were so lucky to um, to have that broadcast and to be able to talk to the country for two hours every single day. I, I always tell people I think it was the best named broadcast in the history of television. And to be able to say, good morning, America, each morning, um, what a privilege that was. What a privilege. You always called it the best seat from which to view the world. And you were so yep. right to be able to be yep. everywhere where history was being made. Yep, yep. And I always used to say if there was an expert on any subject, we'd probably talk to him. Oh. Um, I hate to think what we'd be doing now, um, you know, which is just uh, I, I, I people ask, what are you watching? I've, I've stopped watching. I don't know about you, um, but I've stopped watching as much news as I was because it's um, – it's just all the same, you know, it's, it's, um, it's all the same. And there is no finish line to all this. Um, we don't know when we're going to come out of it and, and, um, and if we're going to go back into it at some point. So it's, it's, it's hard. I, 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 I can't believe that there isn't, um, real stress signs, stress signs showing yeah. up in a lot of people. There's gotta be. Absolutely. Um, it's, well, it's very, very hard. I got to tell hard. you something, what we're doing right now, um, from what I'm hearing from, oh, Cass Wagner is with us too. Hi, Cass. Hey, Cass. Yes. Hi. And yes, everyone is saying, you. yeah, they're all here. And, um, you know, we're, I've had a lot of people say that seeing things like this, I mean, we were such good friends. That emanated, Charlie, that like almost like jumped right out of the television set before we announced the news of the day. And it made people feel comfortable. And that's, I think, a feeling, I mean, from, from reading, it was, here's Ellen Biner. It was such a wonderful, happy way to start every day. This was, you know, the best crew, the best threesome. Um, Spencer always made us laugh. And there was a woman who said that her daughter was little at the time. And she would always say that there was something about you on air talking that you, they that they knew that that made them feel the world was okay. Um, but we had to we had to report on on all the tragedies as well and had to keep our emotions in check. We did, we did, and I'll I'll talk about nine eleven in a minute. You, I did that with Diane, but I but but when you talk about keeping emotions in check, that obviously was the most important day that I ever had a chance to do Good Morning America the, the morning after. But 
but what you say is 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 true. Um, I always say, and you're probably sick of hearing me say it, people wouldn't have their best friends into the house at the hours that we were yep. on the air. Um, the dishes aren't done. The kids aren't, you know, ready for the day. Um, um, your, the dishes aren't done. Uh, they're sitting still in the sink. Um, and here are these three chirpy twerps on a couch, you and me and Spencer, uh, asking uh, for an invitation into their living room. It's a very personal time of day, and therefore people react to you yeah. personally. And I used to say that we would do the beginnings of the half hours together, but then we would go off and do various segments. Yeah. And I used to say in 120 minutes of, of television, Joan and I and Spencer were probably on the air together a total of about six minutes. Yeah. But people would always say, but I know how you feel about Joan. I know, I know what your relationship is. I know how you feel about Spencer. And, and they were invariably right. Um, the, the, the television camera, for some reason, and I don't quite understand why, really does get through all the surface stuff and, and yeah. begin to really give you an idea of what somebody is like. Um, and if you're doing a program like that, which is almost entirely off script, um, uh, you can't hide um, emotions and feelings. Uh, people just intuit, yeah. and they and they intuit correctly. Um, it's an extraordinary phenomenon. And then people would say, as you were just talking about, people would say, you know, you took me through my pregnancy, or you took um, uh, I would my mom and I. She was dying at the time, and we would watch you every morning, and it was so comforting. Um, to, to share that with my mom. When, when somebody would say that, it just was, it was so tremendously touching, really. Um, and I used to say, because it was you, um, largely, who was really the first person in television to take their pregnant stomach and put it up <laughs> over the desk as opposed to under. And I think that was a real breakthrough in television. Um, there were two considerable breakthroughs. One was Barbara, who was the first really great um, feminine personality in television, um, broke up all the old boys clubs. <laughs> and then you who did that with, uh, with when you had uh, Jamie and, and Lindsay and Sarah, um, you said, I'm pregnant and I'm going to share this with the country. And, and, um, and that, was, that was something people, women didn't do on television um, uh, until you came along. Well, I know that it ended up having a real ripple effect through other corporations, but just for other women, I remember getting, we, I mean, you know, we got boxes and boxes of mail. We didn't have, there was no internet back then. There was no email. People actually wrote to us. And, yeah. and boy, did they write about that. I remember women said, thank you for letting my husband and my boss know that as your belly gets bigger, your brain does not get smaller. <laughs> And, um, you know, and I remember bringing Jamie in with me and you and I had such an amazing relationship. And I, I want to take you back to when you you got the job and you came in. I remember the day you came in to to move your stuff into your office and you came into my office and you shut the door and you said, I I, I want us to work equal 50 50. Let's show America that a man and a woman can work together equally. And I took that offer in a heartbeat and you never let me down. Well, you were the, you were the veteran. You'd been there for, for a number of years uh, working with David. But it, it's interesting. One of the senior producers at ABC, when I got the job, said to me, um, you've got to establish primacy in the program. You know, there has to be an alpha male. Um, and that's the way these programs have operated all along with Bryant uh, and Jane, who was at that point uh, something of a secondary uh, person on the show. And um, I think that had been true. David was certainly the dominant personality um, and, and, and very good at it um, on GMA. Um, and, uh, but I, I said to that producer, I think you're wrong. I think this is, first of all, I think the, the and this, this is going to be real sexist, so please don't write me about this, but I think, the, I think the woman is in charge in the morning in the household. She's getting everybody out the door and ready, and she's making sure that the kids have their uh, lunch pails filled, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think, as I said, I think we're, we're very much equal, and um, we're not a married couple. We're not um, 
there's no sexual tension between us. Um, it's we're brother and sister, and I couldn't have had a better sister. Oh, I agree. I remember that you always said you you were happy that I always sat to your left because Arlene slept to your right. <laughs> <laughs> and so you never mix up names because that could get you in trouble. I don't, I don't remember that. But. <laughs> <laughs> you also said that we were like an old married couple. We could finish each other's right. sentence, but we didn't have sex. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, I, I didn't want people to know that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I remember the first, I, it might have been the, your first day. We were in, on Fisher Island in Florida and we were out on the beach yeah. and of course I came out in a yeah. nice little beachy outfit and you came out with your suit you know fresh off Capitol Hill and your tie and as we opened the show I reached over and I loosened your shirt and your tie and I said welcome to morning television I've always wondered did you say oh my god what did I get myself into <laughs> well, and I think the third or fourth day you cut the tie off I, uh, I think I may have scissors and actually stitched it off and um, and, and of course, at that point, I'm thinking, hey, that's a $60 tie. What did you just do? But, uh, um, but yeah, it was, a, it, it, it was a, it was, it was difficult to go to the idea of, of switching from being a reporter yeah. to being a host. And that, um, a, a, a real significant difference. It's a, it's a qualitative difference. And it took me probably a couple of years to realize the difference, um, that, you know that when you're when you're a reporter and you're say you're talking to the president of the United States, you're you're thinking about okay, this is what he's doing, but but where does he need to be questioned about the efficacy of that policy, or where does he need to be challenged in terms of is this the right thing to do? But on the morning program, it is much more relaxed. You're sitting. You know, it was interesting, and in, in, there's a qualitative difference. If you if you remember, Ted Koppel and Nightline was were very prominent at the time we started. I started, and uh, Ted would never sit in the in the same studio with his guests, even if the guest was in Washington. He would be in a different, or he or she would be in a different studio. Um, that 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 you weren't interacting face to face with somebody. In Good Morning America, the guest was almost invariably sitting right in front of you. Yes. And and there's a there's a qualitative difference in that you want to be you want it to be much more of a conversation as opposed to a um, a question and answer session and um, and 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 so it took a lot of getting used to that for me yeah um, it was a couple of years really where where I felt comfortable totally comfortable with that um, I remember a, a story that I tell on occasion I didn't. I couldn't figure out what the show was. And Jack Riley, who was our producer, said it, it, it was like the old Miller beer commercial. It's be curious, have fun, taste great, less filling. Remember that? Ed? <laughs> well, he, he just said, he just said, be curious and have fun. And, and basically that's what I kept in my mind for the, uh, for the 19 years that I did the, uh, that I got up that early in the morning and, and did the <laughs> broadcast. Um, it was, it, and the, the the have fun part of it was was important. Um, you could still talk to the president, or you could still talk to the speaker of the yeah. house, or a senator, or whatever. And, but it it was just different in the way you in the way you did it. It was also different, Charlie, in that if you and I did um, a debate between two people, I remember having like um, you know uh, two people on the you know uh, Phyllis Schlafly and Eleanor Smeal, you know. For women's freedom and and afterwards, people would have seen it with their own eye, with their however they felt about a subject, and they might write us and say, "I think you were on one side or the other." But our goal back then was to, after every debate like that, every spot like that, was to leave the viewer not not knowing what our opinion was. But we were there not to give our opinion, but to elicit our guests' opinion. And that's a big difference in, you know, morning television or just broadcast journalism to, in today's world. That's right. It's not about you. Yep. Um, it's not about you. I remember when I did a presidential debate in 2004 with John Kerry and George Bush, George Bush 43. And, um, and, I, I'm, and I'm actually now involved with the presidential debates to some extent, and you have to keep saying to the moderators over and over, as I used to say to myself before I did it, it's not about you. 
it's you know you are there to um, to elicit responses and you stay out of the out of the out of yep. the way. The problem is, of course, now there's so much focus on the on the journalists themselves. You know, the social media yeah. has, has uh, uh, called attention to that, and and I I, I sort of regret that. Um, when, after I did the Sarah Palin interview, um, when first Sarah Palin interviewed during the Republican, or just after the Republican convention uh, in the McCain year, what, 2008, and um, uh, I got so many emails about, you know, you son of a bitch, you, yep. you, uh, you know, you obviously world. don't like her, and then others, others would write and say, you know, you should have held her feet to the fire much more. Um, I don't write about me. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't want that. So I was, I, in many respects, when people ask, are you happy in retirement? Yes, I am. And I, and part of the reason I'm very happy in it is that, is that I'm not, I'm not getting that kind of reaction. Yeah. People, um, you know, the social media has just changed things. And, uh, I, I don't, I don't want that kind of, I don't want to be in that mix. I'm glad um, that we did the show when we did the show. Yep. It was just a, and by the way, for everybody out there, to give you an essence of, I think, why the show worked so well, too, is that everyone who worked on that show, everyone, I mean, behind the camera, publicity, everything. Um, I mean, I don't even know how many people, maybe you do. It's like well over 100. But um, we get together every year. Now, every single year we get together, second week of December, that group it's over it's a couple hundred people and we all get together and and we all lie to each other and say oh you look just the same <laughs> <laughs> that's true but but we all do say i wrote i wrote phil buth the other day uh not the other day in december after i went to this year saw you there at the at the empire hotel where we were having drinks uh with that party and um uh, I wrote Phil and said, you know, the one thing everybody says to each other is I'll never have another job like that. It was so great. And when you mentioned uh, Cass just now and, and Adrian and Scott. And they're uh, all still commenting, by the way. <laughs> and all the people on the program, those those people were. Uh, and I think part of it was the sharing the uh, adversity of the terrible hours. That's true. <laughs> um, that uh, and, and, and one of the things that was interesting is, you know, normally you work at an even pace during the day in a, in a normal job. Um, but there we had intense, um, uh, an intense two hour period at the beginning of our work day. Yeah. And I, I used to hate the fact that I would be falling asleep in meetings at 11 o'clock in the morning because <laughs> not because I was so tired, but because you have that incredible adrenaline rush. Yep. Um, you, I mean, you are so keyed up. And then at and then nine o'clock, boom, you come down, and and doing that is is really hard, and that's that's when I would be really tired. The other problem is, of course, that people don't realize your stomach never knew what time it was. Oh yeah, because you're getting up at three in the morning or three thirty in the morning, and so when the, you when you want to eat, it's not the time other people want to eat. So if somebody wanted to have lunch, it's uh, four o'clock in the afternoon for you. Yeah. Um, it's, it was, it's a very strange, well, you used to say it's the jump, A, where you have permanent jet lag. Yeah, you, you oh, boy, that's line, for which sure. I used to use a lot. And, and B, it's the job where you get invited to everything and you have an excuse to say no to everything. And you go to cause, nothing. Because you're tired. <laughs> and yeah. we used to go across the street, I remember, to that little grocery store when the, when the studio was on 67th Street. And I'd walk in and I'd say, what soup do you have today? And the guy would say, soup? Do you want a breakfast sandwich lady? <laughs> and also, exactly. you know, a lot of people don't know, but when there was, you know, a war going on, we would do a show for the East Coast from seven to nine. Yep. Then we would break from nine to 10 and we would go back on the air from 10 to 12 when we would do a separate show, a new show for the West Coast. The West Coast. Because at 10 o'clock every day, they always had this international briefing and they would have a bunch of guests standing by you, but you wouldn't really exactly know what you were going to do in that second show completely because right. they hadn't done right. the briefing yet. And in between, Charlie right. would sometimes literally lay down on the sofa in the studio and go to sleep. And I could never figure out how he could do that in the middle of this chaos because caterers were bringing in pizza 
and sub sandwiches. And that's what we were all eating at nine o'clock in the morning. Then you get out of the studio and somebody would say, so now you want to go to lunch? Like, I just ate pizza at 9 a.m., remember? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, sure. When, during 9-11, um, in the period of 9-11, we were actually, Diane and I were going on the air at 6 a.m. because, um, anyway, the network was broadcasting 24 hours. The news yeah. department was broadcasting 24 hours. So they had us go on at 6. And we went straight through till noon every day when you went off the air on the West Coast. And... Um, and that's really exhausting. That was that happened for about four or five weeks, and that was really hard in the wake of seven eleven and nine eleven, seven eleven, nine eleven. Um, but but the one thing I learned in the service, this when basic training in the service is all about sleep deprivation, and I learned basically if I've got ten minutes, I can put my head down and go to sleep. You were so good at uh, it. That's a rare gift. Yes, it really is a gift to be able to fall asleep. Sometimes it's a little unnerving if you're reading in the evening and <laughs> long you fall asleep. But, but um, uh, it, it was uh, it was something that I did learn in the service, and it was a great uh, help when I was uh, at GMA. I remember but, after I remember after leaving GMA, I was doing um, behind closed doors a lot, and I remember yeah. the producer would call me and say, "We need. We're going to ask the Pentagon to let us in to wherever cockamamie story we were trying to." do he'd say put on that navy blue suit with the short skirt and high heels and meet me at the washington airport at 7 a.m so i would fly in <laughs> and i would be walking across and i would have gotten up early to get make that flight and i remember saying to the producer i'm like so tired and he said well of course you know you got up early today i said no that's not the point i'm realizing at this moment that i'm tired because I got up early, but this is actually how I used to think was normal. This is how I used to feel every day. And I thought it was normal. I can now recognize that it wasn't normal at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, I used to get up at, when, I, when we lived in New Jersey, I used to get up at 3.20 and 3.21 in the morning. It's back time. So Always 3.21. It was because I. It took me 39 minutes to get up and shave and shower and do what I had to do, and it was times I would walk out the door exactly at four. Um, me too. The, the guy they used to send a car. Uh, mm -hmm. for us. I used to think it was such a luxury to have a car. No, they sent a car because they wanted to make sure I was awake. Uh, yes. They wanted to make sure there was a driver out there to knock on the door if he didn't show up. And, My driver knocked on the door a few times. I must admit. <laughs> I, I had the same thing. I would wake up in a panic occasionally when I had shut off the alarm without actually waking up. Mm -hmm. But um, but that that became the, the sort of became the norm. And I I would watch um, Jeopardy at night at seven o'clock, and um, and I would think to myself, if you don't go to bed now, you're, there's no way you're going to get eight hours sleep. And I had young kids eight at the time. Hours. And of course, they want a dad. They want somebody who's you know, shares the evening with them. And if they have a question about their math homework to, uh, to talk to somebody. So it was, um, I would usually go to bed about 10 and get up at three twenty one, yeah. And, um, and then I guess by Wednesday or Thursday, I would need a nap. Um, cause, cause you just can't sustain that for yeah. forever. But the, the, the story I remember from early on when, uh, when I had first started, it was in the first year, and we had a couple of guests on uh, who had been, who were just plugging a movie, The Princess Bride, if you remember that movie. Okay. And it sounded very intriguing. It sounded like a terrific movie. So I called the kids and I called Arlene and I said, come on into town. <laughs> and after I get off work tonight, we'll go to the seven o'clock show. So they came in and we went to the show and the first frame of film came on and I went right to sleep. And, and I woke up when it said the end and the credits were running. And I looked over to my daughter, Jessica, and she said, pat me on the shoulder and said, you loved it, Dad. It was, you, you really loved it. <laughs> I've never to this day seen The Princess Bride. I remember I would go in at night and lay down in Jamie's or Lindsay's bed and read to them or just be talking to them. And after a while, they'd like tap me and they say, Mom, you need to go into your bed and lay down and let your brain rewind. And I, I was like, first of all, these kids are watching way too many videos. And then if that's the way they think it works. 
So how are the girls? How are Jessica and Katie? For 19 Katie? years, I never got to read anything that wasn't for work. Um, I, me I too. I author that was coming on 150 pages, and, and if the book was good, I'd finish it. But uh, anyway, there's a, the girls are, yes. I don't know if you can see them. I see. Katie and Jessica are right behind you. Just like, look. Yeah. Jamie and Lindsay are right behind a, me. Yeah. This is a portrait that was done by a wonderful artist named John Sandon uh, into the year 2000. So this was uh, what 19 years ago. The kids are now grown. Now we have five grandchildren, um, and um, um, Jessica and, and Kate are both great. Um, they're both, you know, at home, um, homeschooling the kids and and working uh, as well. Um, Jessica's in Seattle. Kate's in Minneapolis, and uh, oh. and uh, she, they, and their husbands are at home along with the kids. And, and uh, but they're both in very great good shape. And the and the grandchildren now range from ages well jack is going to be two in may and uh reese is the oldest and he's 14 so i got him two to 14. <laughs> so i have and i'm and what do they call you my grandkids call me uh, jojo call you what jojo i'm jojo jojo yes where'd that come from because oh, Joan, Joan. because Lindsay okay. Lindsay married a great guy in weinberg and uh, Evan's mom called me one day and said, all right, what is kids going to call us? I'm Louise, so I'm going to go by Lulu. I suggest you go by Jojo. Then we don't have to be go by Grandma. <laughs> so it's stuck. So what do you go by? Um, I was Charlie. Wait. Um, and then um, my, I was just, it was Grandma and Charlie. And then my younger daughter, Kate, had her first child, uh, a daughter. And and she would never tell us anything about the name. And <laughs> she, the baby was born at Mount Sinai here in New York. And Arlene and I were there, and we went into the delivery room about, I don't know, 15 minutes after the baby was born. And my daughter Kate said to me, Charlie Gibson, I would like you to meet Charlie Canada. Oh. Um, she had a daughter named Charlotte, but um, they, they call her Charlie. Um, and oh, so um, cute. I was that it was that that's was a moment in my life, I must say. And um, and as I say, Kate's married name is Canada. And um, and Charlie and, and I are good friends. Um, <laughs> but I couldn't be Charlie anymore because now that's her name. And and she has primacy, boy. Does she oh, have yeah. primacy? So it's now it's now grandma and grandpa Charlie. So I'm grandpa Charlie or uh, um, and that's 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 how it's evolved yeah i remember when i married jeff his birthday's march 7th and my Lindsay, of course is march 7th and he said okay i can see that i'm always going to get the you know the tail end of the cake because Lindsay's always going to come first here we are talking about Lindsay and jamie and i just see sarah on here saying hey what about me <laughs> <laughs> i mean is if, sarah on yes is sarah watching yes one of the great moments that i will never forget was when we were in Sweden doing a week of shows and we were staying at the Grand Hotel right there on the water uh, in Stockholm and I was coming up to your room we were going to go over script or something and she came out in the hall she was I don't know how old at that point probably three and yeah, um, she, she saw me down at the end of the hall and you know your kids and I we would always say hi to each other but not Sarah she came running down the hall I mean full tilt and jumped into my arms and I remember I dropped the script uh, that I had in my head and, and but it was one of the most enthusiastic moments and, and I, it touched my heart um, I, it was great and I will always have a special uh, place in my heart for for Sarah Krause absolutely and then of course the three girls came back on with me with Jeff when when we had twins. Do you believe I have four teenagers, teenagers, and that we're out looking at colleges? It, it's crazy. Are you? Are you? <laughs> yes. Are, are they going into their senior year in high school? Uh, yeah. Yeah, they're juniors. Wow. And yeah, so wow. I haven't taken them to Princeton yet. Remember, we had, um, we had this bet going. I, I think who was the president of UPenn at the time? And we were inter you. You may have been interviewing her. 
What is it? Kerr? Ruben, Ruben was her last name. She, was, um, she had been the provost at Princeton and she became, I think, the first female, female. Ivy League president. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, Judith, Judith, Judith Rudin. Yes, yes, that's right. Good for you. Wow. I love it when the memory kicks in like that, don't you? And I remember, yeah, yeah. and so she said, well, um, your daughter's going to have to go to UPenn. And you said, oh, no. I mean, this big, of course, Princeton-UPenn rivalry. And so after um, Lindsay got into UPenn, um, I remember I got a note in the mail that says, just tell Charlie I won. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I ever shared that with you, but. <laughs> no, I never heard that story. Uh, um, such a great university. Um, actually, my first date with Arlene was on the campus at Penn. We went to the Penn Princeton football game. And, oh. Uh, and had a date that night, went to a bar called Smoky Joe's, went to an Indian restaurant. And I thought that night, uh, it, was my, it was the fall of my senior year in college. Arlene was at Bryn Mawr. And I remember thinking that night, I, I think I would like to be married to this woman. Um, oh. And lo and behold, a couple of years later, uh, it came to pass. Four years later. And a good thing, because you guys have made a, a great, great pair. She did get mad at us <laughs> once. Remember? Oh, yes. Oh, I know what that was. Yes. Go, you tell the story. All right. So she got really, really mad at us once. So, well, first of all, we, we got into... New Zealand landed on the South Island and we were like we yeah. got into a bus because we would they'd always load us into buses and take us to the hotel and as we're going through this little town there were all these um storefronts bungee jumping parapenting whitewater rafting and you said I get what this place is about it's 50 ways we can kill ourselves but we had an extra day Queenstown, Queenstown. Queenstown. so I yeah. said meet me in the lobby eight o'clock and let's go acclimate, you know, let's go see what we can get ourselves into. So of course we took a camera crew along and we, I think we started the day by paraponting off the mountain. And then we went in that whitewater rafting thing down the dangerous the river, boats. down the, the yes, jet the jet boats down the river gorge. Just and then, and then we did this. And you're not so great with heights. Right, I hate them. but you got us. You but you got with the program, and you went up on that old bridge with me. And there was something about there was this whole big um, area where people could come and just watch people bungee jump. And at yep. some point, they all started in ten, nine, eight, and it just like when they got to one, you just went. Um, I did a swan dive, and I remember I was like pursed my lips be for fear because we were miked for fear i might say something i might not want recorded <laughs> and afterwards we walked we went back to the hotel we walked in and, and there was a rule by the way at abc because there had been a helicopter crash that took out five top disney executives at one time so they made this rule because disney had bought abc that the stars of a show couldn't travel on the same plane together and i can neither confirm or, nor deny whether we ever did that um but we walked in and charlie what we walked up to the executive vice president at the time i think it was phil buth phil buth and charlie says we have some good news and some bad news the good news is that we did not fly on the same plane together and then i said but we did jump off the same bungee same bridge, bridge together. Right, yes. And he looked at us and then he cracked a smile and said, did you get it on tape? <laughs> That's right. And of course Arlene we did. Was furious with me. Oh, she was Arlene really was mad. And she was mad at me too. Sorry, Arlene. Yeah. Well, she was mad at you because I, I remember the story somewhat differently. We got to Queenstown. We walked into the office area. Um, we would go on the air on Monday. Actually, mm -hmm. we taped the show, I think, on Sunday. But it was, it was. Uh, I think, I, I've forgotten what day we came in. But anyway, um, and everybody was gathered around a television set. And they were watching tape of a bunch of the staffers who had bungee jumped. And I was really? horrified <laughs> at the thought. I mean, the, my fear of heights would uh, never would I do that. And I was and fascinated. I, and I, said that, I said, they're crazy. Would you ever do that? And you said, in a minute. 
And I thought, <laughs> oh, hell, if she doesn't, I'm going to have to. Um, and and so it's, I blame you. But um, it's total. It's my I bad. Also, I did it. It was I my bad. I, I did two jumps at once, my first and my last. Um, <laughs> but I, but it, 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 there's something about challenging your worst fear and overcoming it that um, that gives you some sense of satisfaction. I was very sobered after we did that. But yeah, and I, and I when they tell you to look out at the horizon, don't look down, look out at the horizon. <laughs> and they're and right. Beautiful horizon. And then I remember when they counted down and you and I went um, and I, re, I I could I could paint that picture. I remember what the river looked like down below me. Um, and the and boat, they, the boat that was going to pick us up looked like it was about this big. That's how far yep. down it was. Yep. And remember, yep. they asked us if we wanted. Well, first of all, they must get on a scale. And we all signed yes, all the waivers know. that we'd never sue anybody. And then they said, OK, get on the scale. And all the women said, oh, no, no way. We'll jump off the bridge, <laughs> but we're not getting on the scale. And then we realized it was in kilos and none of us knew how to convert kilos to pounds. But they wrote it on our wrist how many kilos yep. we were. And I remember when I was out, you climbed through to the outside of this old rickety bridge onto this little, like, I don't know, maybe two foot by two foot piece of wood. And you're and they they put like a towel around our legs and then tied the bungee cord to it. And there was a guy behind you. And I was holding on to him. And I said, Would you just push me? And he said, no, we're not allowed to do that. You have to jump yourself. And he said, but if you keep holding on to me like that, I'll take you to dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember, was it your, your assistant at the time? Samantha. Was Samantha, was it? Yep. Samantha. And they asked you if you wanted to, I mean, it was so carefully calibrated. Yeah. That they asked you if you wanted your hands to go into the water. Or your hair. Do you want to dip your head? Right. Like, exactly. What? Really? And she, and she went, she, we all said no water. We yeah, all said no water. water. And so they said dive off um, and you won't go yes. in. That little bit of hypotenuse uh, to the to the fall would, would keep you out of the water. And Samantha at the last minute just toppled over. She like and, got down, she like bent her knees down and went in like, you know, a four or five year old would go. Right, but it exactly. meant that she, she got, had, she got wet. <laughs> and I remember when she came up, she was yelling, no more water, no more <laughs> As water. As she was going back up, upside down, because you go back and forth a few times, which is right. kind of the queen part. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, look, look, Charlie, I usually go a half an hour. We, of course, could talk, and people are here saying I could watch you two all day, but we won't make them do that. But we have gone about an hour. So I've got, but believe me, I've got plenty of time. There's, there's, there's nothing going on here. I will, uh, I will go back to. I, I mean, the, the, the big time of the day is about uh, five o'clock. Uh, that's when I change from my daytime pajamas into my nighttime pajamas. <laughs> I want you to know, I took off my UGG bedroom slippers and put on sneakers for you today, and I even put a necklace on. So this was like a big oh. deal. Oh, have you here? Absolutely. So listen. Do give, my, do give my best to all the kids. Give my best to uh, to Jamie and Lindsay and Sarah. I'm, I love the fact that Sarah's on now. I, I'm very, very fond of her um, for that, largely because of that moment in Sweden, which I'm sure uh, she doesn't remember, but I will never forget. And um, and I send best love to you, of course, kiddo. Um, we're all doing this individually. And um, and it's, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm 77 years old now. And I think, you know, you've only got so much time left um, and to have to spend it, um, you know, in total inactivity is somewhat frustrating. But but so many people have it so much worse than I do. And yeah. and people are struggling. The PI, When I look at the unemployment numbers now, when you think about um, people who, you know, who you, who you run into during the day who and are critical, people don't realize in New York that it's not, that it's a very personal sort of city because nobody has a car, so you walk everywhere. Yeah. So you, the New York repeats itself every six blocks. Mm -hmm. And so you know your druggist and you know your grocery store because you walk to all those places. And I, 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 every day when I'm at, but well, we don't go every day, we go twice a week to the grocery store, fully soaked and masked. 
Um, but I'm so grateful to those people at the yeah. checkout counters and the people who are restocking the shelves. And I, 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 I want to hug them. I although you can't get within six feet of them, yeah. but, but they are they are so wonderful. And I look at the when I'm out taking a walk and you see the buses, which are on a regular schedule. God bless the bus drivers, but there's only two or three people on the bus, and they're mostly cops yeah. and and uh, um, day workers who are going somewhere. Um, and I and I think God bless all of them. I, I'm I'm so so blessed in having um, having somebody to share this with, but having a lovely apartment in New York and 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 being able to do this in in in, in comfort um, because there are so many people who have yeah. got it so much tougher. And I, I I just say a prayer for them every day. So Charlie, I want you when this is over to watch to to look at it and on facebook and look at all the comments i want you to make sure you read all the comments you really need to see all of this as i say that we have to stop i hear oh michelle says oh please don't stop scott snyder says it was so great seeing you again and smith davis says you've got to have them come back again soon everyone is saying Book them again right now and have a come back again. We want to hear more stories. You guys don't miss a beat. Um, here's Gail Richley. Wow, you are such old friends. You didn't skip a beat. I like long term, not old. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> hey, Allison Kluger. Allison Kluger Yay. saying, this was incredible. Love to both of you. GMA was the best job I ever had. Um, rock on, you guys. Definitely have them come back on. And Bob Witz, no hands on the face. I cleaned my hands. I'm fine. And I'm totally here and not going anywhere. Um, oh, I'm terrible about it. I'm terrible. Yeah. About it. That's why I wash my hands um, every other 30 seconds. All right. So we're at an somebody, hour. Somebody sent, me a, uh, somebody sent me a picture of a hand with all kinds of writing on it. And, and the caption was, I've washed my hands so often that I found the answers to my old eighth grade social studies test <laughs> on the hand. Um, Allison Kluger, I, I remember so fondly, Allison had accident uh, just before yeah. our first, uh, she was, she was uh, prepping the our trip. field to, of dreams. Uh, in the, as, as I remember it, um, she was prepping our trip to the Midwest, our first bus trip that we did when we went to Chicago, Milwaukee, where do we? Go. I think we went to Minneapolis, Omaha, Kansas City. You're and, unbelievable. Uh, she was prepping that trip, and I think had a bad car accident. Yeah. And um, uh, she really gave it the office. A wonderful, wonderful young woman who worked for us. We were we were blessed in staff, um, um, and I'm glad that she thinks it was the best job she had. Well, and I I will tell you. And, I, and Charlie week. Allison is now a professor at Stanford University, and she has a class on. Um, journalism and preserving your integrity. And I was a guest, a guest uh, speaker one day in her first year, and it's gone on. I think she's been doing it about seven years now. So that's really terrific. Um, she is oh, a great. Oh, Allison, get, get in touch with me. Yeah. I have, okay. I have friends in Palo Alto, oh, very, good. very close friends in Palo Alto, and go out and visit them on occasion. I'd love to. I'd love to visit your class just to see you teach, if not if not to speak. Yeah, it's a really cool class because she has people from all different fields of, you know, top athletes, top movie stars, uh, journalism, uh, from all fields talking about integrity. And I'll tell you, I've, I've been scanning a lot of these and they've been saying you guys respected each other. Um, I think for one of somebody from the show said you weren't just correspondents, we were family. and. You know, that's part of the problem today that we don't have respect for each other. It's everyone's saying this is beyond yeah. uplifting. This has made me feel good today. Um, I just love hearing these stories. Uh -huh. So will you promise me you'll come back another day and talk? Just do stories, a little walk down. Whatever you want. All right. I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. Okay. I, I can't even go out and try on gloves. Um, me too. As I, as I put on weight, I keep telling Arlene it's, it's all in air. <laughs> I can't get a haircut. All right, sweetie. Best to Arlene. Thank best to the girls. Thank you. you. Hi, Spencer. <laughs> All right. Take care. And of course, he's saying goodbye to Spencer and everyone else and, and all of you guys. I don't usually keep you guys for an hour, so, um, but I won't apologize because it was awesome, wasn't it? It was really awesome. All right. Um, 
tomorrow, a long time uh, colleague of mine who was the very first assistant I ever had is gonna be here. She's gonna talk about five things you don't know about Joan London. I hope that she keep, I don't know what she's gonna say. I'll have Lisa Gibbons on Friday. So bye everybody, namaste, as always, stay safe, stay home.